Well, hello, my name's Sean King, and this is Kyla Hedge. We're from Bethany Christian Assembly, and we're going to talk to you about recruiting and attracting talent and then what to do with those people once you find them. So again, I'm Sean King. I'm the creative arts pastor and the music pastor at BCA, and Kyla is our development director, so she takes all the people that we find, trains them, and gets them scheduled and working for Jesus in the church. So although we are in a different ministry lane, with music, and this is really focused on children's ministries, we're really prayerful that uh, the content that we share today will be beneficial to your music team, because we all need people working with us in the church, amen? How many of you guys like to work alone? Yeah, or like to even be alone. I am not a guy that likes being alone. In fact, I hate being alone. But in ministry, sometimes we really get focused on what we want to do and what we want to accomplish, that we forget that ministry is supposed to be done together. And so uh, today, as we talk about recruiting, if you're a person that likes to work alone, I encourage you to just pay attention and let's see what we can do to get more people uh, working together with us in the church. So I'll be talking about uh, attracting new talent, and uh, new talent might be scary to you because it's something that's different and uh, you don't know what you're going to get. But let's, let's jump in as we talk about the top 10 things that you should be doing to attract new talent to your church. All right, so here we go. The top 10 recruiting tips for ministry. First, focus on relationships. I bet if you gave yourself a little bit of time, you could think about who knows everybody in your church. And the truth is that that person is probably known by everybody. So when you're talking about finding new people, you want to make sure that that person is in your arsenal and you talk to them often. Uh, it's not that you have to know everybody, but you want to know who does. Secondly, you can't build new relationships if you're sitting in the green room. Now, the green room is kind of a music term, but maybe that could be your office. Or if you're, if you're tidying up after service and you're not working the crowd in the lobby, you're missing out on an opportunity to meet new people. So fight that urge to just be busy and make sure that you're, you're surrounding yourself with people because you need people. All right. Secondly, Recruit leaders by position and be a team recruiter. When was the last time that you sat with the youth pastor or you sat with the music pastor and said, hey, what are the, what are the things that, that you really need? Who are the people that you need? And then you were able to share with them as well. Because so often we meet people or maybe there's a great message about serving and people are responding, yes, I want to serve. And then you're talking with those people and you don't know what to do with them. I really need someone to be in the nursery changing diapers. But this person is telling me that they're great at baking cookies. Well, come to my house and do that. But I don't have a place for you in the church. Well, if you're talking with other leaders in your church and you know that they really need someone that could just make baked goods because because the music pastor loves baked goods, awesome. You don't have to necessarily have it a place for them in ministry, but if you know where that place is, that's an awesome place to be. And then you also know that your youth pastor or your music pastor, they're reciprocating, so you're going to be a team recruiter. Secondly, a person may not be a fit for you now, but you don't want to forget them for a future event. So make sure that you are keeping in contact with your youth pastor, or your mu music pastor, other people on your team uh, for not just your current needs, but future needs. All right, so recruit leaders by position and be a team recruiter. Third, know your real need. So do you know what your needs are? Really, do you really know? I think so often we, we think, man, I just need people. I just need people. I just need bodies. Well, yeah, it's good to have bodies, but we also want to give people something to believe in, something to own. And so if you haven't taken the time to sit down and write out what your real needs are, positional needs, like I need a third grade teacher. I need someone in the nursery. I need someone to just check people in. The broader your list of needs, the more opportunity you're going to have for people that you meet. Because if you're really focused on one thing, you're probably not going to find that exact person. So uh, be, be specific with your expectations. If, if you're talking with someone and they're like, well, what do you need? I really want to serve. I really love working with kids. And you say, well, we just need people to show up. Well, that's not really specific. And sometimes people will be resistant because you're not clear on what your need is. So how can you communicate that? So 
in re- reference to your elevator speech, you may not even know what an elevator speech is. When I think of an elevator speech, I think, how am I going to communicate who I am, what I'm trying to accomplish in the most, in the shortest amount of time? So if you're riding in an elevator for 20 seconds, this is what you share with someone. So for me, in music, I will say, man, I love leading people in worship, and I love getting as many other artists as possible using their gifts to do the same thing. And I would love to have you be a part of that, whatever your gifts are. So how could you translate that into children's ministry. Think about what your elevator speech is. Be prepared going into a conversation. Give it some thought. Maybe you've never really sat down and thought, man, what's my elevator speech? If I'm just winging it, maybe I'm not that good at that. So spend some time, your elevator speech, and know your specific needs. And another cool thing is if you're able to overcome people's objections before they ask them, you're going to set yourself up for a win. So if you're dealing with a, with a mom who's a single mom and she's got kids and you're asking her to come serve before church, you can, in your, in your appeal, you can say, man, I know that you have kids and so we're prepared for you. So when you come serve, we're going to have someone there to help watch your kids. In fact, we're going to have a snack pack for them when they show up so so you can really do what you feel called to do. So overcome their objections before they ask them and you're going to set them and yourself up for a win in recruiting that person. All right, number four, keep an updated list and add to it weekly. Are you tracking names? Are you tracking your roles and what's, what's still a need for you? You know, so often I'll meet someone and I'll find out that they're a great builder and I'll think, man, I don't really need a builder right now. But then six months down the road, I'm thinking, oh, man, I've got the stage project. And what was that guy's name? I forgot it. And then maybe maybe they've left the church because I didn't plug them in. Or, you, you know, I just don't remember who they are. And I've lost contact with them. So you want to make sure you keep a list, update it often, track what works and what doesn't work. You know, maybe... I don't know, and you're talking with somebody, and you're like, man, I, maybe I shouldn't talk about the fact that I've got halitosis really bad, you know, or maybe I shouldn't say, man, you stink, you know, or whatever. I don't like tall people. Uh, whatever that might be, track what works and what doesn't work, keep a list, and if you can help yourself get better at recruiting, that'll be uh, a positive thing. All right, number five, think outside the box. Uh, Embrace technology, Facebook groups, Twitter, promote your ministry. How are you going to do that? You know, so often we just think, man, I just need to hang out in the lobby and shake hands. And that's awesome. That was point number one is you got to be visible. But, you know, what are other ways that you can be creative to attract people to your ministry? Use your own people. Have have pictures of you and your team having fun because people will want to be part of that. So think creatively. Think outside the box. Another thing is you could do is hold preview events. So if you want someone to uh, be involved in music like we do, we might say, hey, just come to a rehearsal. We'll show you how it, how it works, how our in-ear monitors work. Because for a lot of people, this is brand new to them, especially people that are brand new to faith or brand new to the church. You want to make sure that they have an experience where they come and feel comfortable. And then finally on this point is make their first experience an amazing one. You know, we have had many experiences where we we think we're ready to go and we have people join us for a rehearsal and then it's just not very organized and people are feeling a little bit uncomfortable. You're introducing them to new people. They're in a new uh, environment that's completely foreign and they leave feeling like, oh man, that just wasn't a win. And then they don't they don't follow up and you try to reach them and then they don't respond and you're thinking, oh, what a missed opportunity. So make sure that when your when your volunteer shows up for the first time, make that just a killer experience. Make it fun. Have donuts for them, have coffee, have your team know that there's a new person there so they can get to know them. Because now they're not a stranger. Now they're part of the team and they'll feel engaged. All right, moving on. Number six, work your system quickly. Maybe the question you should ask yourself is, do I even have a system? So this will be a great thing for you to learn today is, man, I just need to be a little bit more organized. This, you know, flying by the seat of my pants isn't working anymore, and I'm finding myself doing ministry alone. So for us, we like to recruit, equip, and release. So if we find someone and they're attracted and they've shown interest in what we're doing, how do we get them engaged, trained quickly and how to use the in-ear system, how to, you know, how to run PowerPoint for your kids' slideshow, whatever you're doing, train them and then release them to do that. If people wait, if you wait too long, you know, sometimes people respond to an appeal to serve and 
uh, and, and they're ready and they're 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 moved by the the appeal for service. And if we wait too long, man, how many of you know we get distracted, life gets busy, and that opportunity might slip away. So if you're given a name of somebody who's interested in, in ministry, follow up with them quickly, get them engaged, help them meet other people of your team so they feel like you really do value uh, and you want to support their call to ministry. You know, call to ministry can be just to serve. So make sure that you do that. Work your system quickly. Number seven, recruit always everywhere in every setting. Setting. You know, when was the last time you recruited someone outside the church to help? You know, that could be just something that could get someone into the church. You know, I, I drive and I see guys walking down the street with a guitar and I think, I'm going to stop and talk to that guy and see where he's using his gift. Maybe he's never even considered using his gift in the church. You know, I, I think often we might even discriminate in our own minds who can and can't serve. I'm not talking about discrimination like because of someone's, uh, the color of their skin. I'm talking about we have an idea of a person that we want for this specific role. And if that person that we're talking to doesn't fit that, we, we disqualify them. So keep an open mind and make sure you don't discriminate based upon what your first conversation might be. Uh, Is there a contentment problem? Maybe you're satisfied doing ministry alone, and I just want to encourage you to to open your mind because ministry can get lonely, and you don't you're you're not going to have the greatest impact if you're doing it by yourself. So don't be content with where you are. And uh, just another reminder: you always need to be equipping and giving opportunity for other people to be serving alongside you. All right, number eight. Build a team that can recruit and nurture them well. Man, that's one thing that we have really enjoyed in this last season of ministry together is we have built a team of coaches who are in charge of drums and guitars and pianos and vocals. And we have these people uh, in our team and they really feel like family now. And uh, we've been spending time with them socially. So so often we get together because time is tight and we want to hit people with the things that we want to talk about. But not a lot happens relationally that way. So we have been very intentional in this last season to spend time. You know, just a few weeks ago, we went miniature golfing in Redmond, and that was an awesome experience. And then we went and had ice cream together where we did talk a little bit of business. But that whole night was really uh, built around just... um, just spending time with people. And you know, we do, we do share our vision with those coaches, the importance of recruiting and coaching and raising people up, giving them the opportunity to serve along with us. And this last week, we had a really cool experience where we had three brand new people, brand new to the church that were there to kind of see what who we are. And uh, Kyla and I were talking with them. And uh, as soon as the musicians were done, literally we had six of us surrounding these three people. It was a little bit of a mob, uh, but it was awesome. Awesome. And these people, I know the next time they come back to church, they're going to feel like they belong, they have people, they're not alone. So make sure that you're raising up people who know your vision, who know that you want, and they're, you know, we want to be welcoming, we want to be inclusive and give people the opportunity to serve. Ministry is not about us, it's about sharing what Jesus has done, and uh, the more people you have sharing that message, the better off you'll be. All right. Number nine, identify areas of weakness. Do you have a weak link that may be working against you? Now, this could be a sensitive topic. You know, if you've got Agnes in your church who's been serving for 50 years and she's just awesome and she loves kids, uh, you don't want to say, okay, Agnes, we've got a 21-year-old here who's just better at kids than you. Uh, You don't want, you want to be sensitive, obviously, and we're so thankful for people who are faithful. Uh, But let's make sure that there's a transition plan in place. Maybe there are people who just have lost the fire. They've lost the vision. You want to make sure that you're taking care of people who are faithful, but also taking opportunity uh, for new people who want to serve alongside of you. All right. Finally, ask the tough questions, and this is really an important place for me to pause. You know, so often if we're losing people on our teams, we have to ask the question, man, am I being a poor leader? Am I coming across as arrogant? Am I coming across uh, in a way that's unappealing to people? If people aren't joining your team, maybe they just that you come across wrong. So ask the tough questions. What do I need to change? God, is there something in me that needs to change because I'm having a hard time reaching people who want to be on my team? So am I the kind of leader that people want to follow? So those are good 
uh, good, tough questions to ask yourself. All right. Well, we've talked a lot about recruiting, the top 10 tips, well, my top 10 tips of recruiting. And now we're going to switch to, okay, so now we have people. What do we do with them? So we've, we've got these cats. We want to herd these cats. So I'm going to turn this over to the cat lady, Kyla Hedge. Well, like Sean said, my name is Kyla Hedge, and I have the opportunity to be our development director in our music department at Bethany Christian Assembly. So we're going to talk a little bit about tips that can help be more effective and efficient when we schedule our volunteers. We all know that sometimes scheduling can be kind of a little bit of a bear in ministry, um, whether you have a small group of volunteers and you're struggling to fill holes or you have too many volunteers, don't we all wish we had that problem, and we're trying to fit them all in. So we're just going to go over a couple tips on ways that we can maybe um, help mainstream our scheduling process. So some five things that we're going to cover are scheduling in advance, using a planning tool, um, creating a standard schedule to work off of, being intentional with scheduling weeks off, and communication. So scheduling in advance. One thing that we all know is that we live in a very, very busy society where people um, have a lot of things going on between their kids' soccer games. There's a family in our church that has three different soccer teams happening within their family right now. Family vacations, jobs, you name it. We have a lot going on. So scheduling in advance is really important. I would recommend scheduling at least one month in advance. It just gives everybody time to either, A, they can go in and block out days that they are unavailable so that you know that when you schedule or B, it lets them know, hey, so-and-so, you're on the schedule on the 17th and they can put that on their calendar, which hopefully will prevent declines in the future. Um, but I would also say um, it's best not to schedule too far in advance. So we want to give notice, but not so much notice that by the time we get two months, three months down the road, Joe doesn't even remember that he's on the schedule anymore um, because he has so many other things going on. Um, another component to just being cautious with how far in advance we schedule is we want to schedule in faith, if you will. And by that, I mean we want to um, leave room for our team to grow. So we don't want to have so many people scheduled so far in advance that you get a new team member and you say, great, we're so excited that you're on the team. Um, we're going to plug you in three months from now because most likely you're going to lose them. Like Sean talked about, we want to be um, concise and effective in our recruiting and applying the people and actually getting them engaged in the team as quickly as possible. Um, so leaving room for your new people so that way you don't have to put them off for a long time or have the awkward like, hey, Bob, can you not do this week because actually I need to put the new guy in there. All those are just awkward and we don't want to have to deal with that. So schedule in advance but not too far in advance. The second thing is to use a planning tool. So how many people are familiar with or use Planning Center? Awesome. At our church, that's one of the main things that we use. It started off just as more of a tool for our service components and our worship team, but then now we've spread to every single department really uses that to schedule their volunteers, including our children's team. So there's a couple of things that are really helpful um, when you use a planning tool, both for the scheduler, which might be where you find yourself, and for your volunteers. Um, so we'll just go over a couple of those things. So for the scheduler, it helps you because you can um, send out and keep track of scheduling requests and those can go out via email or even through an app on your phone and even some phones now if you have the little widget side of your phone um, you can have planning center on there and it shows you your upcoming things you're scheduled for too so that's really helpful and also for the scheduler if you have um, people who are going to be serving weeks in advance, you can set up reminders, one, two, three, however many days in advance, to just say, hey, remember, you're scheduled to serve in this area on September the 17th. Um, that way it stays on their radar, even amongst their busy schedule. Now, for the volunteer... Um, a couple benefits are, one, they can go in, they can block out dates. Most people know when they're going to be on vacation. You know, sometimes stuff comes up that we can't predict. You get sick, your kid gets sick, something happens. But for the most part, we kind of know when we're out of town, when we're taking a vacation, so they can block out dates. The second thing they can do is they can set preferences, which really helps you knowing when your volunteers are available and what type of role they're looking to fill. You know, do they want to serve only two times a month? Do they want to serve only on the fourth Sunday of every month? And they can do that so then when you go in to schedule, um, it kind of pops up a little thing that says, oh, this is blocked out, or this preference says that this is not a preferred time for them to serve. Um, and then at that point, you and them can kind of make the choice as to whether or not you'll schedule them for that time. 
The third thing to do that's helpful is to create some sort of standard schedule to work off of each month. It's really beneficial because then you don't have to start from scratch every month when you go to schedule your volunteers. Um, some groups may have a good rotation. You always know that this person serves the first, this person's the second, third, fourth, and so on. And so you can kind of create a base schedule for yourself. Sometimes, of course, we have to make alterations, you know, if somebody does have their vacation this month and it happens to be the regular time that they serve, you can swap that around or maybe it's just that they are not available this month, so you have to fill that hole. Um, so it helps you in just making your life easier and quicker. Um, and then also for them, it helps your volunteer kind of stay more in track of when they're doing it. Not only are they getting reminders through um, some sort of software, not only are they um, seeing the schedule come out, but now they're remembering, oh yeah, I consistently serve the first Sunday of the month, which just makes things way easier for them when they're trying to remember what to do and schedule their calendar. A thing that I think is really important and often overlooked, especially for staff members and leaders, so we do this to ourselves, is to be intentional about scheduling weeks off. So often we do look out for our volunteers and that's really good, but um, we forget that we need breaks too. So this uh, point I'd really say is for all of us to remember, sometimes we just need to go to church too and not have that serving element going on. Um, it's important to avoid a couple things for yourself and your team members. One, to avoid burnout. You know, I actually work with a lot of youth students and nobody wants to be burned out at 15. So we need to give them some time off um, to be kids or to be um, parents and just to be at church with their families. Um, the second thing that it prevents is entitlement syndrome. Everybody knows that person that thinks the church wouldn't function if they didn't show up that day. And we don't want that either. We want healthy teams, we want excited teams, we want passionate teams. And we want teams that work together and teams that support each other. And that includes supporting each other and having time off. The last thing, and I think probably the most important, is to communicate. Communication is so important, um, especially if you have larger teams or several teams you're coordinating. Because you have so many people that you need to get at different places at different times doing different roles. And that can get really confusing if you're not on top of the communication game a little bit. So a couple of things that... Um, I found that have been helpful is just to communicate before and after you make your schedule for volunteers. You can send out, you know, just a quick email like, hey guys, I'm going to be sending out the schedule for this next month. Would you just take a second and block out dates in planning center that you know that you're unavailable? Um, you can even give them a deadline like by Tuesday the 5th, please block this out because I'm going to make the schedule that day. And then following that, another one, hey, the schedule is posted. Be sure to be aware, looking, where are you scheduled, where are you serving? And so that they're on top of that. One thing that I have definitely noticed, and I am totally guilty of myself, is um, we get so many emails from Planning Center that you just start to kind of like tune it out, you know? So many come into your email and you're like, oh, it's just another scheduling thing or it's just another reminder. So I know like a lot of our um, musicians and people who serve just don't even look at them anymore. And so if I want to convey something important or something like the schedule is coming, please block out dates, I've learned to make a separate email group group um, and send it out from my personal email instead of planning center um, that says the info I'm trying to convey or even sometimes I will send group texts to people too in addition because most people have their phones on them during the day if they're at work or whatever they're doing. Being really effective in your communication helps put the responsibility of schedules back on your team and takes that off of you. We all have lots of things that we're coordinating and scheduling, so it helps to share the responsibility a little bit and be a team player in this way. Um, one, it helps put the responsibility on them to know and remember when they're scheduled. You've already made the schedule. Planning Center has reminders that are automated that are going out because you set it up. So now it's on them to remember, put in their calendar, that they're going to be there at this time on this day to serve, which is really helpful. Another thing is to have them help you find a solution if they're unable to make their scheduled date. Now, I don't know where you're at in your ministry, so maybe this isn't a place where you are, but if you are there, um, I would say just give them clear, concise um guidelines for how to fill those spaces. Maybe you say, this is the pool of people that you can pull from, or these people are really our uh, leaders who are able to lead this class if you're not able to come. And that way they know the boundaries of who they're asking and what they're doing. And it takes the time off of you. You don't have to worry about filling that hole anymore because we all know that declines happen. And sometimes it can be a little bit of a trick to fill all those holes effectively. So just to recap, kind of what we talked about, um, tips are scheduling in advance, 
using some sort of a planning tool, some sort of standard schedule, being intentional with weeks off, and communication. I hope that you're able to use some of these tools, plug them into your church, or even come up with new ideas uh, to encourage other people in your church community and outside in other churches. Thanks.